Uh, I'm Michelle Morgan and I'm the co-founder of Liberty, which is a youth-led creative network. And I'm the founder of PJs, PJs with Purpose. And I'm here to, I think, I'm still kind of working it out if I'm completely honest, but I'm here to share my own personal story and experience of burnout. Um, in the context of being an entrepreneur, but also in the context of being an average human being. Um, we all have mental health and uh, none of us really knows how it might be tomorrow when we wake up. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot of stuff over the last 12 months about my own mental health and what I've learned is um, that if you have conversations about it, if you share your experiences about it, it doesn't have to be an awkward conversation and it might just help someone else. So I'm trying something different out this year because prepping for presentations and speaking publicly really makes me quite anxious. And so uh, what I'm trying this year is to not prep. <laughs> this is my first one. <laughs> I'm really anxious. <laughs> So I'm learning as I'm going. It might not be the best approach for me. Um, I'm also really, really hungry, so if my tummy rumbles, I'm really sorry. And if I pass out, can someone pick me up and feed me? Um, and if you can smell spray paint, uh, that's me as well, uh, because my husband has spray painted this pair of pyjamas for me today and uh, put them on a bike uh, for me to collect and put on. And the reason I am wearing pyjamas is that uh, about eight months ago, um, I was talking to my friend Lindsay, she's one of my best friends, and we were talking about pyjamas, uh, because I love pyjamas and I love spending time in pyjamas. And she does as well. And she said that when she comes in from work, she likes to take, literally take her clothes off from the day, put her pyjamas on. And it's when she feels at her most real version of her and she sort of takes the day off and puts the PJs on and she sort of feels her most honest and, and authentic and so I guess the reason that I'm here tonight to talk to you is to share an honest story so I thought well I'll put my pyjamas on <laughs> as a way to kind of stimulate that thought of uh, being open and honest and then, uh, and then I realised, oh no, I haven't done my toenails for months, because it's the winter months, so front row, please don't look at my feet. Um, yeah, and I'm going to try and share uh, a bit of my story. Um, oh yeah, and that was the other thing that we just talked about, wasn't it? So I have told this story once before. Um, and I said, if you want to get a sense of how vulnerable I feel standing in front of you with my pyjamas on uh, and a new pair where I slightly don't know if they're even see-through or not, <laughs> which I said, avoiding the light, um, you could take your shoes off because you'll feel a little bit vulnerable like I do. So if you want to take your shoes off, go on, Marlene. You don't have to because I don't want you to feel awkward. But if you want to... Do it. And I know Michael was saying to me earlier, oh, are you doing it in bare feet? I was like, yeah. And I know you want to do yours in bare feet, really, don't you? Okay. okay. Isn't it weird how taking your shoes off can be so noisy? <laughs> Some people going, oh my God, this is my worst nightmare. <laughs> Only do it if you feel comfortable. Okay. Um, and you're going to give me a five minute warning. So uh, I just want, what I hope is that by sharing a bit of my honest story, it might help. If it helps at least one person here tonight, then it is worth the, um, the dry mouth and the pumping heart and thinking, what the fuck am I doing standing in my pyjamas in front of these lovely people? Um, so just a little bit about me. I'll try and speed through 46 years. Um, I was born in... 
Beckenham in Kent. And then when we were about four, we moved to Essex. So I am an Essex girl. Um, and, uh, and I had quite an unremarkable childhood, really. No big dramas. Um, and I started secondary school and I kind of, I navigated the early years of uh, secondary school okay. I wasn't brilliantly academic. I wasn't terrible. Um, when I look back, I think I didn't really know why I was there. My daughter's 13, and I always think she really knows why she's at school, and I feel really um, thrilled for her that she does. Uh, but I navigated it okay, and then when I was about 14 or 15, um, my dad left home, uh, and that was probably like, the most traumatic thing that had ever happened in my life, and it was definitely really traumatic for my mum, and I kind of had to see, you know, I sort of witnessed firsthand what, what it was doing, doing to my mum. Um, and then... Quickly after that, uh, it was O-level time. That you can tell now how old, old I am because GCSEs hadn't come in. I think they came in the next year. And, and I pretty much failed most of my exams. Um, and, and then I went to college. Uh, and I thought, I'll do drama at college. And I went to college, but I was a bit of a troubled teenager by this stage. And so I didn't actually go to college. I'd go in the opposite direction on the central line up, up into town. And, and actually, at the time, I was a bit of an Essex girl goth, which was a very complicated uh, image for you to put into your minds. I wasn't really the stiletto and blonde hair. I was, yeah, quite gothy. Um, and, and of course, because I didn't go to college, I then got chucked out of college um, and then began the wilderness years. And we won't go into those tonight. Um, but, you know, I learned a lot about myself and I tried a number of different jobs out and careers. And, um, you know, I can look back and see that every single one of those slightly bizarre jobs helped shape me and, and helped get me to... Uh, 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 the place well, where I am today, but also uh, in my uh, in my mid twenties, it, it got me to um, Hong Kong, and it was in Hong Kong that I managed to blag my way into uh, an advertising agency. In that sort of slightly weird thing, when you can go to a different country and sort of become someone different and talk <laughs> your way into to something. I suddenly developed much more confidence when I was there. And then sort of fast-tracked my, my way through agency life and came back and, and got a job in a, a brilliant little agency in Soho and worked my way up to account director and was leading on all of the, the youth accounts there. And, and, and actually, I found something that I was pretty good at, F what, for me, felt like the first time in my life. And yeah, really, the truth is, I was really, really good at selling fizzy drinks and expensive trainers to young people. Um, and it was in my 20s, and it was quite creative and, and, and innovative, and, and I was pretty good at it. But one day, I met this guy called Sam Conniff, and he was running a, a little youth media agency as well. And we had this quite remarkable two hours of, of conversation and sharing and kind of pulling, pulling the world of agencies apart and pulling the world of brands apart. And this was in the year 2000. And, and just to give you kind of a, a context of the timeline, it was the, the year before Naomi Klein had just brought out no logos. So things like corporate social responsibility didn't really exist that much. The, the, the rumblings and the beginnings of, you know, how, how should we behave as a brand were beginning to happen and not just as kind of a weird add-on on what charity we're going to support this year. And we wondered, could you have an agency that you loved, a, a place of work that you loved going to, um, but that also created solutions and campaigns for clients that delivered business benefit, delivered brand benefit, but that also and always delivered some kind of measurable bene benefit and social impact to young people? Or was that an impossibility? Um, we put a business plan together over the period of three months. We pitched it to the bank. We got a little loan. We gave ourselves six months. And in I stand before you in 2018, and, and Liberty is a multi-million pound award-winning um, agency that, that, is someone from Liberty here? <laughs> um, th that I'm incredibly proud, proud of. Um, we measure our social impact as often and as much as our financial impact and performance. Um, and so we've spent, you know, we spent 16 years really trying to prove this model of how can you have 
purpose and profit in an equal balance. Um, the truth is they're never really in an equal balance. So now it's can we place an equal importance on both purpose and profit? And during the year of 2016, we made the decision that actually we wanted to grow that social impact in, in the world and our place in the world. And so we uh, embarked on an investment deal and I led on the deal. And um, it was brilliant. It was something new for me. I was learning. I was getting huge amounts of energy. I was leading the team up another mountain. It was absolutely wonderful. But about a few months in, I developed what I called investment headache because I just felt like I was, you know, I was working even longer hours. Um, and then I developed tinnitus and, uh, and a few other things were happening for me as well. And not only were we doing the investment deal, but we, yeah, it was just one of those years when a lot was going on. Um, it's quite difficult conditions in, in agency land. It's, you know, a vast and ever-changing landscape, as many of us know. I had a few people issues that normally I just would have dealt with. It would have been fine. We would have got, but they were really emotional ones, and they were they were they were particularly painful. I was starting a renovation on my house. My daughter was embracing school and had this amazing part in the school play, and so I was ferrying her around. and And life was really really busy. And we closed the deal, uh, and and all along I'd said, well, you know, let's close the deal. And I'm really going to sort this headache out and really start kind of looking after myself. Um, so we closed the deal and then I thought, I'll just get the first 100 days of the relationship done because that's really important. And then I'll start looking after myself. And I worked out that um, it was on day 105, um, just at the beginning of December in 2016, that I completely and utterly and violently physically and mentally burnt out uh, and it wasn't very pretty and it was a really difficult time um, and I went to the doctor and what was curious to me looking back and, and this is a big part of why I share my story is it was much easier for me to talk to my board, who are an amazing bunch of individuals, but we were a new dynamic as a group of people. So I think this is why it was particularly hard. This is in the workplace. It was much easier for us to talk about my heavy periods, my fibroid, my impending loss of fertility, because I was gonna have to have a hysterectomy to draw a line on the health issues that I'd had, than it was to talk about the two other words that I had mentioned, which was mental health. My mouth's really dry, so I'm just gonna get a drink. In fact, everyone was kind of relieved when I said I've gotta have a hysterectomy because it meant that we really didn't have to talk about the mental health bit, and we never really did ever again, still. There are lots of lessons to be learned from that. The other thing that happened was the brilliant thing that, that the board supported me on was, was creating time and space. And so I did, over Christmas, I had some of that time and space to really start resting and, and recuperating after the kind of a, a lot of the physical things that were happening for me. And then something else happened because I'd created that space. I realized that actually my purpose and my passion for liberty had completely and utterly burnt out as well. And that really frightened me and made me incredibly sad. But it, it was a truth. And so what then happened was I knew I needed to change my relationship with liberty. I knew that I needed to put health and happiness first. And actually, I needed to put my family first. And, and that sent me into a really terrifying world of anxiety as I just could not see what I would do next. But I, was, I knew I need, needed to do something because I was well and truly stuck in a place that was not, not, no longer a good place for me. I always say that liberty was built on fun, faith and friendship, as well as that notion of purpose and profit. And the fun and the faith and the friendship had really sadly disappeared. And... I just want to talk about what the anxiety feels like for a moment. 
Um, you know, if you ever have a nightmare and you wake up with that kind of that jump and, and then your heart's going really quickly and you sort of, you're like absolutely terrified for a moment and then you go, okay, that was, a, that was just a dream, it was a nightmare. For me, I felt like that 80% of the time for a while are just constant terror. And if I wasn't in constant terror, I was constantly crying. I didn't know why. Um, and then I dropped into what I now know is depression because the absolute opposite to the it running through your veins is nothing. Absolute hollowness, helplessness, despair, can't really be asked. Would rather sit or lie in the fetal position watching really, really weird programs in the daytime about people who are looking for somewhere to live in Spain. Uh, <laughs> there's loads, like absolutely loads of these programmes. Totally bizarre. And I got really, really obsessed with them. And my, my daughter would come back from school and she'd be like, Mummy, you're not watching this programme again. You know, she wanted to watch something that she wanted to watch and it was not those programmes. Um, and, and I knew that something was wrong, but I, and, I try, and I'm quite a resilient person, and I actually, uh, yeah, I do quite a lot to look after myself and and to develop myself as well, as a professional and as a leader. And and I bought the Ruby Wax book, Frazzled. Has anyone read it here? And there was it, and I, and I was really, I was already doing a bit of mindfulness, and I, I was really curious about this kind of evidence that Ruby had found, and. Uh, and so I was just reading the book as kind of part of that distraction and because I couldn't really be asked to do much much else. And there was this moment where Ruby describes falling back into depression when she was writing the book. And I was reading it with tears running and I was thinking, well, what she's describing is how I feel. She's calling it depression. What? I just thought I had a bit of low energy. I'm having a bit of a moment. I've had a couple of moments before. And it was reading Ruby's book that got me to my GP. I was already seeing my GP because of all the physical stuff. And actually, I was already seeing my GP on a regular basis because my GP knew that something else was going on. So I was incredibly lucky. You know, thank God for the NHS. Um, and I said to her, I think I've got depression. And, and we started that conversation and we explored medication. Um, and I am in no way anti-medication at all, but there was something very deep inside of me that quite quickly got a grasp on this. I think I was almost relieved to be able to give it a name and then almost surrender to it. I personally felt like um, I need to feel this and I, I, do know, I know that I'm gonna be okay. I don't know when I'm going to be okay and it's really frightening, but I think I'm going to be okay. And so I decided to take NHS talking therapies. I did some hypnotherapy. Don't knock it till you've tried it. Um, I bought the car map. And that was my biggest streak, 27 days. And I, and I did it, you know, it, and that became... Thank you, Michael, for creating that. Um, I can't tell you what that did to me and still does. Tonight I was really anxious. I went and listened to you know, the daily calm. You know, it grounds you. It's incredibly valuable. Um, and I did a number of other things. And then the other thing that I did, because I'm quite a resilient person and, and I knew I need to think about my what next and I thought I'm not getting a fucking job as someone had suggested. I was like, I haven't had a job for the last 16 years, mate. <laughs> as any entrepreneurs here will know, because it had been suggested, don't worry, you'll easily get another job. I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't know nothing. Um, so I gave myself permission to play with this idea of if I did it all over again, what would I do? And I thought, well, that's really easy. I'd do another purpose-led business. I'm one of the poster kids for it. It's what I truly believe in. Second rule of business or career, as we all know these days, do something you love, do something you're passionate about. Oh, well, I had depression. <laughs> I wasn't passionate about anything. And I would wail to Remy, my husband, who knew the exercise that was in progress. 
I'm not passionate about anything, Rem, apart from sitting in my beautiful PJs that you bought me for Christmas. Him and Lily had bought me these really nice PJs from Liberties. And they were literally the one thing that I think, well, at least I've got nice pyjamas on. Oh. I did this slightly pathetic now when I look back. And I knew that art was really important to me. Um, my husband is an artist and we've got lots of mates in that world and we're really fortunate to have some of their art. And during that period of time, I was amazed at how every morning I would wake up and the wall in front of me had a piece of artwork by our friend Jabo and it would bring me literally such calm and distraction uh, and, and peace often for in those kind of anxious times. Uh, and then, and this is the bit, guys, where this is possibly where I'm at the crossroads of where brilliance meets madness. I suddenly thought, could you make pyjamas <laughs> that are designed by artists and that use their product, the labelling, the packaging, the platform from which we sell them, the social media channels where we talk about them, could we use that product to talk about mental health? Because what I have found over the last 12 months is that actually it's not awkward to talk about mental health once you start talking about it. It really isn't. But it can make a really, really massive difference. And I did think at that point that I had gone mad. Uh, but I said it out loud to a few people. And... They didn't think that I had gone mad. They were like, yeah, and what if you did this? And what if you did that? And, and so just for a while, I just played with the idea. Um, and that's a real lesson as well. Um, kind of just playing with ideas about what you might do in the future or what you could do now um, and not putting too much pressure on yourself can be a really amazing thing. Um, then in... Uh, are we all right for time? Then in the April, that operation, the hysterectomy, which is also one of those words where you can see everyone in the audience going, <laughs> um, So I had the operation. Um, and I was beginning kind of, in terms of my mental health, I was beginning, you know, things were like the fog was lifting and things were becoming a bit clearer and I was starting to manage things a bit you know, a, a bit better, and I was still playing with this idea. Um, and I was also, you know, having a really useful conversation with my pals at Liberty about kind of how I might come back into the business. And, and always I'm so grateful for the time and space that they gave me, that the, the business gave me. And I had my operation, which is a major operation, but it's quite a common operation. So they did the operation, and it all went fine. And um, I remember sort of that, the phase of, the beautiful phase of morphine. Um, when the consultant came and he said, I'm fine. And Remy and Lily came and they went off for the night. Um, and then shortly afterwards, my blood pressure started dropping quite rapidly. And they moved me. I got like this upgrade to this really nice room that was overlooking the River Thames. And had this beautiful light and you could see London Bridge. And um, it had this like pink light coming through. It was, it was, it was a bit like being in a dream or a film. Um, and then more and more people came in, and my blood pressure was still dropping. And they said, it, "We think that you've got." Um, it, it tells us that you're bleeding, but you're not bleeding. But we think you might have an internal bleed. And it, in the end, I uh, th I had to go back into surgery, and um, it was quite an amazing experience because. Um, I hadn't had a team now for some months because of the depression and the time off work. And uh, these amazing medical people became my team and I knew that I needed to really connect with them all. And I knew it was really important to keep calm as well. Um, and we kept really calm, but then everything was... Sort of, they were getting a bit nervous. <laughs> well, I don't know if they were nervous. That's me totally projecting. Um, but I could tell things were getting a bit serious. Um, and then they, you know, some of them started to tell me to hold on and stay with us. And I thought, fucking hell, that really is like, you know, film. And then I did say, am I going to be okay? And then I got really nervous. 
Uh, and then they took me down to the theatre. And then I woke up in intensive care and I was in intensive care for two days. Uh, but I was alive. It's amazing, right? Um, <laughs> and and I was, uh, the reason I share this is because then I got quite excited for a moment. So I thought, oh, I've had one of those near-death experiences. I'm never going to feel anxious or depressed ever again. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be so thankful for living a life every day. because I'm, And I was truly, honestly, grateful to be alive. I really was. But I did really think that I was just going to be the happiest person. And then, of course, that is, <laughs> life isn't like that. Um, but I do use that memory and that experience as part of my toolkit now for my own uh, mental health. Um, because it's that thing about gratitude, it's that thing about joy, it's that thing about what is actually important in life. Um, and so that's kind of part of my daily toolkit, not thinking about that particular time every day, but that, that gratitude. Um, and also I thought, fuck it, life really is short and really fragile. I'm going to give this P. Joys idea a, a go. Oh, I hadn't said the name, had I? P. Joys. I was like, we're going to be the hoover of the pyjama world. Um, and so that's what we're doing. So the, the quick update is, actually, I've joyfully gone back to Liberty, but now as a, a non-executive director, I bring opportunities into Liberty, I support the team, but I'm not there that much. And that's okay, because the, the business has this new team leading, they have energy, They've got all the passion and the purpose. And all that passion and purpose is what I and Sam and everyone else who's come before had already put into the business. So my beloved Liberty, who I suddenly hated so much I thought I could never walk into that room ever again, I am really proud to be able to walk back in that room occasionally now. Um, and we're going to give P-Joys a go. Uh, so we're making samples and creating brands and I'm trying to work out how you make bloody pyjamas. Uh, and not only that, um, of course, mental health is everyone's issue. James, as you, where's James? That was a really beautiful talk as well. Are you still here? James? Oh, yeah, he's doing his podcast. He was brilliant, wasn't he? Um, you know, and as James reminded us, we've all got mental health. How's yours going to be t tomorrow? None of you really know. None of us know. Um, lost my train of thought there. Where was I? Pajamas. Oh, yeah, right. So that's the thing. <laughs> We've all got mental health. And mental health goes through the whole of the supply chain as well, right? So, because there was this moment where I was like, I can't be another like fashion brand adding to, you know, because once you start looking at the whole fashion industry, oh my God. I was like, oh geez. So, okay, so we can only do this if we create the most kind and caring, ethical, sustainable business. I'm not going to say ever, because as I'm realising, that's going to be quite hard and it's going to be a journey. But that's the ambition. So we're literally looking at, I'm look, well, we, <laughs> I say we, it's just me. Uh, <laughs> but I have these am amazing cheerleaders and I hope that you're, some of you will become my cheerleaders as well. I've got like a subscriber database of 170 people who I send mail, mail, uh, like mail chip. I've had to learn how to do MailChimp and <laughs> run social media accounts. Like for, for a youth marketeer, I can't tell you how shocked I was about how little I actually know about marketing. <laughs> That's really nuts, isn't it? When you run a business and you suddenly realise that, you know, you've spent a lot of time, you've wasted a lot of time often. Um, and especially when you don't do the work of the business anymore, it's kind of a weird thing. Anyway, that's definitely a tangent. Um, so, some other things um, that I just wanted to share or say that I've learned. Stopping, like if you are in crisis, or even if you are just a bit low, or if you're a bit confused, or if you don't really know what you're feeling, if you can stop and create space and almost stay in that space, there's this idea that I've got that I need to figure out really how to explain a bit more, but embracing free fall, kind of not pulling the cord too quickly, I think has 
been the making of my 12 months. It would have, I could have gone and got a job or put my brave face on and gone back into liberty. They probably wouldn't have been the right things for me. So kind of embrace that free fall moment um, and kind of open yourself up to the world or the universe to sound slightly hippie and, and, and let the new things come in and play with those ideas and see where it leads you. Um, ask for help. That's maybe the most important thing that I can say to you. If you're struggling, it's not. don't think that you've got to grade it, how bad it is. If, it's, if you're feeling bad, you're feeling bad. And if you can, find someone to talk to. And there are so many people or organisations or your GP. And if one GP doesn't work for you, go to another one. Um, or if there's just someone you can trust. I was told it's a bit awkward when you talk about it to the business. This was early on and it is not the case now. Uh, and that really stayed with me, and I, it made me feel awful. And then I felt like I was hiding this thing from the business, and I am quite an open person. And actually, I have found it is not that awkward once you start talking about it. And I can't tell you how many conversations I have had over the last eight months now that are really beautiful, open conversations. And I tell you what, you get to a better business conversation if you've had a conversation with someone about human stuff it doesn't always have to be like oh have you got depression um <laughs> but it's amazing how many times i have shared what's been going on for me over the last 10 months and it all i'd say eight times out of 10 someone tells me their mental health story and it might not be theirs personally but it will be their mom or their brother or their partner or someone they work with because we all know someone and we just got to start talking about it more. Um, oh, and um, so the last thing that I thought I would do is, as it's so quiet, I thought we would take the opportunity to be truly quiet. And I'm going to stop talking. Uh, and you're going to, you might feel a bit uncomfortable, but it's all right because you already got your shoes off. So we'll just go one step further. Um, and what I would like you to do, just like us all, if you can bear it, just to close your eyes and we'll just be quiet for a, for a, a minute. And it's totally up to you what you think about. But what I hope is that if there is anything I have shared with you or that you've heard from the other speakers tonight, um, just ask yourself, what can you do about that? About it? Can you actually, can you have a conversation with someone? Or... Is there someone in your life that you can maybe spot some changes in their behavior? Maybe they, they need to have a conversation. So can you think either from your own point of view or those, that the point of view of those around you? So I'll stop talking and let's just be quiet for a minute. We are incredibly hard on ourselves sometimes, us human beings. So my final words is be kind to yourselves. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.